And at one point, we actually had a play tester that was so frustrated with the game that he stood up and said, if I bought this game in a game store, I would take this bleeping piece of bleep and light it on fire and throw it in the trash can. Started Genius Games about five years ago. It started out as a hobby. I've always been a board gamer. I've always loved games. And I'm also a scientist, and I just noticed that there weren't any science-themed games in the marketplace. And that kind of bummed me out, because I liked playing games with sci-fi themes and dragons and orcs and all kinds of crazy worlds that don't exist in reality. But I wanted something that was a bit more hard science, something that I could wrap my head around and maybe even learn something from. I noticed there wasn't much on the market about that, so I decided to start making some of my own. This is the first game I published to Kickstarter. It's called Linkage, a DNA card game. Our second game was Peptide. Uh, this was a good game, and it sold out pretty quickly. Our fourth game here was Covalence, a molecule-building game. This is a game where it's a, it's a cooperative puzzle-style game. Our, our fifth game, rather, is Virulence. This game, I think, is probably one of my favorite games to play of all of our games. And then our sixth game is Cytosis, the one we're working on right now. So I've been married for five years. My wife's name is Marlene. We have one daughter. Her name's Nora. She just turned three, and we have a boy on the way sometime in April. So I do a bunch of things currently right now. Um, I run Genius Games. That's my full-time job. I design all the products for Genius Games. I run the business side of Genius Games. I also teach game design at Webster University in St. Louis and teach a class on Kickstarter crowdfunding. There's two things I, I try and teach my students from day one, and that's that people don't come for the game, they come for the experience that the game offers. And this is really, really important to remember when you're designing a game, and it affects so many things and so many decisions about the process of designing a game. The second thing I tell my students is that the game design process is a process. You don't just come up with an idea and then that idea gets published. Uh, the, the final product for a game, the actual published game, rarely looks anything like the initial idea. And so uh, throughout the process of designing Cytosis, it's been two years now, and we've went through so many iterations to design this game. I think anytime I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking of a new science concept or listening to the news about some hot topic with viruses or diseases or something like that, I, I think, man, can I turn that into a game? Uh, and one concept that is really important uh, that every human deals with on a regular basis is cell biology. We don't really know it, we don't have to worry about it, but our cells are these little machines that make up our whole body. And I'm really curious about you know, how they do that. And I know there's lots of other people. And I know uh, quite a bit about cell biology from my background, and so I thought, you know what, why don't I make a game about cell biology? It started out really small and focused. Um, and the game got bigger and better and better as time went on. We've been developing it for about two years now, um, and it's unbelievably better than the first few iterations. All right, so this is the uh, original prototype. Or I should say, this is where the idea came from. I sketched most of it out on uh, just a large piece of paper. The nucleus, uh, mitochondria, rough ER, and a bunch of notes about how I wanted the game to play. Just a bunch of ideas and, and principles I wanted to make sure were incorporated in the game. And then this turned into a sketch up that I did on a plane. I don't remember where I was coming from, but it's a little bit more detailed version of how the game would play. So resources would start in the nucleus with your DNA and you'd have to replicate that into mRNA or messenger RNA. That messenger RNA would go out into the rough ER and you'd translate it into proteins on the ribosomes. And then those, um, those uh, pieces you synthesized there would go down in the Golgi apparatus. Wasn't exactly sure how it was going to play out, but just got a good idea of the overall components. Um, and then a bunch of the ideas for how components would convert things in the game that I would want to make sure are in there. Most importantly, we had lipids, proteins, um, we had DNA and RNA, and we had carbohydrates, right? The, the four main macromolecules, and obviously ATP as, as currency. And then after this prototype, I ended up throwing together this board right here. 
So you can see we have the nucleus at the top. If you place one of your workers here, you would get two DNA cubes. If you place it here, you'd get one DNA cube. Here in the smooth ER and the rough ER, this is where you start synthesizing your protein hormones and steroid hormones. Um, then, and then I, at this point, I had two Golgi apparatus, and you'd move your steroid hormones down into this Golgi apparatus and your protein hormones down into this Golgi apparatus, and then you would add your carbohydrate cube or your, your lipid cube down here. Later on, we ended up putting these together because we realized it was just a, a path that didn't have any, um, any competition or restriction. So if we made everyone have to go to the same Golgi apparatus, everyone is now fighting over that spot there. That makes it a lot nicer. And now you'll notice that instead of a two and one conversion ratio, we have a three and two. And what, what ended up happening through a lot of play tests is um, if someone placed in the two spot, no one else wanted to place in the one spot because it was half of the resources. So three and two is a little bit better. If someone gets the three, at least two resources is still, uh, still pretty good. And you can see all of the, uh, here's a lot of the math behind the balance of the game. What I ended up doing was um, I considered the cost of every meeple placement and then um, what each meeple placement awards you and how many meeple placements it takes to get, say, one RNA cube and one protein cube and one lipid cube and how many placements it takes to complete an entire card. And I'll show you some of those cards, but to complete an entire card and just make sure that all the cards that you're trying to complete um, will score you points in a balanced way. That your one card's not going to get you twice as many points as another card, even though it takes the same amount of resources, right? That would be kind of silly, unless there is some kind of um, risk attached to it. You can also see in this version that we used to have this tile spot for a, a, an advanced game. And we play tested this many, many times, and it just it didn't work out, so we actually ended up removing that completely from the game. But the colors are a little bit different. This is a print that we got from um, Office Max um, or Office Depot, whichever one it is that didn't go out of business. Um, yeah, so you can see it's, it's really similar in a lot of ways, but with some of the things we changed, we instead of two Golgi apparatus, we have one single Golgi apparatus that everyone's fighting for. I usually create all my original prototype designs in Publisher. I use Illustrator and Photoshop as well, but I feel like those programs are kind of like using a sledgehammer to nail an attack for a picture. They're just really robust and you don't need them for just throw in some layouts like this. So the cards I usually always design um, the width 2.45 inches and the height 3.45 inches. And that, that way when you print it off, we print it off on 110 pound card stock and you can see it slips right into one of these card sleeves really easily. And if you need to get it out for any reason, it slides in really, really well. If you make that card much bigger, say 3.5 inches by 2.5 inches, it essentially gets stuck in there and it's hard to get out. And that's annoying. So anyway, I make it a little bit smaller. Um, this is the, one of the original prototypes. And then I'll show you what we do after this. On, on this screen here, I'm going to go over to uh, the Game Crafter. And the Game Crafter is what we use to create all of our prototypes. And um, so I'll go into My Games here and you can see Cytosis, a cell biology game. We've got a bunch of different versions. Um, this is the second version, and I can show you the decks that we actually created in here. So we've got the um, cell component cards here, the event cards, the first player card, and the goal cards. We can go in and edit each of these, and you can see what the newer... Let's see here. Let's find one. Yeah, right here. Here's what the uh, uh, ster or protein hormone cards look like now. In, in the Game Crafter, rather than what we have over here. And then um, the steroid hormone cards, I can find one of those real quick. Whoop. There's another, what that, that looks like. And so we print the prototypes through the Game Crafter, and then um, we've got a nice deck. We move from that to the Game Crafter stuff, and we've got a nicer set of cards we can use to play the game. And so you can see the progression there of the, of the art, how it looks now. And, I can find a protein hormone here. Well, there's a protein hormone receptor. That's what that final receptor looks like. So you can see the progress of, of the art there. And that's what the final box is going to look like. You can see the, the cut lines and fold lines for the, um, 
for where it's going to fold along the box edges and so that's the bottom that's the top and the sides and the face and we have a back but i forgot to print the back and yeah so that's the progression of the game for the most part um it's been many many years i think here i've got a play test this is a play these are my notes on a play test we did back in november 3rd of 2015 and this is when the, the game was pretty substantial at that point um yeah and we we already had a bunch of suggestions and changes we were making but one of the things we're thinking about doing is upgrading these cubes before we had these well in the prototype it's just these plastic cubes that you can get on amazon you can get thousands of them for for dollars which is really nice um <clears throat> in the game in the final version these are going to be nice wooden cubes starting out at eight millimeters and then mo moving up to 10 millimeters maybe bigger but i think 10 millimeters is probably big enough because that's a 10 millimeter cube one of the ideas we've had is upgrading these components to components that look like the ac actual m macromolecules. So that would be, um, that looks more like DNA, although in the game it would be mRNA. That would be a, a carbohydrate, essentially cube, or a carbohydrate resource. And you can see that it's the hexagon shape, just like the molecular shape of a, a single glucose molecule. And then a amino acid, or a protein. And what, what's kind of fun about these is they can combine, the amino acids can combine and create a uh, peptide chain. So that was something that, it, it, you won't do that in the game ever, but it just might be really fun for people to play with. And these could have silk screening on them. So one side could look like the um, individual amino acid, and then as you flip it around, it looks like the connected one. So you can flip them, you can have them all laid out and then flip them over and connect them into the polypeptide chain. So there are a number of things that I think a good game has and that we try and incorporate in our games. The first is that it offers players interesting decisions. There has to be decisions that a player makes that are interesting to make, that it balances risk and reward with chance, that one decision isn't obviously better and gonna reward much more than any other particular decision. Uh, the game offers players both short-term tactical decisions and long-term strategic decisions so that they can not just have uh, something to look forward to on this turn or, or have the, the most optimal turn, but those turns can combine in a way where they're, they're making strategic choices based upon the way that other players are playing the game. I also think that it's really important to have a game that's simple to understand. You can start playing right away, it's not too complicated, but it offers a depth of gameplay and engagement. I think it's also really important that a game has tension and then a climax and resolution, like a story, a narrative arc throughout a game. And lastly, that the theme is engaging. And for Cytosis, the theme is obviously cell biology, which is extremely engaging to me and all my geeky friends and hopefully thousands and thousands of other people out there. You know, it's really difficult to take a hard science topic and turn it into a board game. I mean, with a board game, you want players to have interesting decisions. You want the game to be intuitive and simple. But when you're using hard science terms and you're trying to represent the processes in a cell, this is, this is extremely difficult. So what we, what we did is we started off with a really basic, simple, core idea for a game. We knew we were going to use worker placement. It's simple. You place the workers inside the human cell. And in the organelle that you place in, that organelle gives you uh, actions. The actions or, or resources that it rewards you are similar or, or accurate to what it would do in science inside your an actual human cell. And then from there, uh, from there we got lots and lots of feedback from play testers. Play tested over and over again, and we make small changes. And we tried not to add anything into the game to fix the game. Rather, we would fix the core game itself before we made it any bigger, before we added anything in fix the core game, and then add on components that complemented that core system, that core worker placement system. We wanted all of the resources in the game, all of the cards, all the actions, everything to represent accurate science, real things that our cells and our bodies are doing on a regular basis. And at one point, we actually had a play tester that was so frustrated with the game that he stood up and said, if I bought this game in a game store, I would take this bleeping piece of bleep and light it on fire and throw it in the trash can. And, you know, I, I had to stop and, and sit back and, and I tried not to get offended even though I was a little bit flustered by that, but it was apparent he was also pretty frustrated. So what, what I learned from that was that a lot of times players might have 
really strong responses to games. You might really like something or really hate something. And that it's important as a designer to listen to the feedback. And not just listen to the words, but listen to the frustration and focus on where that frustration comes from. What is it that happened in the game? And if it's something that's a problem, you know, how can we fix that? We can we could take it personally and we could get frustrated, but the only thing that's gonna get hurt is is our feelings and the game's not gonna the game's not gonna be any better for us. But if we can really listen as game designers, that game will get better and better.